Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the BBR Museum. My name is Melissa Moore. I'm Director of Education, and we are thrilled to have you here on a big night of celebration around the Collection Month Partnership Program. What is that program, you ask? Mm -hmm. That is exactly what we're going to be exploring tonight. So, as I mentioned, we're glad you're here. I will say we have some refreshments that are complimentary in the back of the lobby. Even as we're getting going with the program, please do go ahead and get a plate. We have tons here. Also, we have a cash card that's going to be going on for a little while into the program. Uh, consider this maybe your last call. So if you did want to get a refreshment, we have a few more minutes. One more is great. He's back there. We'll help you out. And then he will start kind of closing down as we get into the thick of the program. So tonight we're featuring two amazing curators and good friends. We have Vanessa Sage, who's assistant curator of fine art design here in the Thinky Art Museum. And we have Thomas uh, Eusebio Ritter, who is the Richard and Mary Allen assistant curator of American Art at the Dawson Art Museum. And before I turn things over to them, I want to just tell you a little bit about why the two of them are here and what that collection of partnership program is. Because it, it's a very special moment for us, and as I mentioned, one of the first time to celebrate. So, the Art Bridges Foundation out of Bentonville, Arkansas, and that may sound familiar to you. Alice Walton is um, the heiress who has dedicated much of her life and passion and funding to the foundation, as well as the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, also in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, she has this passion that goes beyond the, the spatial limitations of her museum and of her foundation. So in terms of collecting American art and showcasing it, making sure people have access to it at no cost, she realized that uh, there is so much art that she is unable to show there. There is so much art in this country and in the world that just sits in storage, especially at some of the bigger art organizations and museums. And so she put together this collection of loan partnership program with museums that have large collections and either can't display them all because they're, let's say, closed for renovations or for a rebuild, or because they just don't have the space in their own uh, facilities. She's partnered those museums with museums that have a lot of space and have collections that maybe aren't able to, to acquire works that, in their own collection of the same. Uh, price level or caliber at some of these bigger museums. And so by partnering that and by streamlining that process, by taking care of the cost of ensuring and shipping and, and uh, programming around it, the Arbiters Foundation uh, with Alice and the Health is able to really bring more arts to more people across the country in celebration of the spirit, the great spirit that is American art. And so we're really excited the Figgy to be a borrowing organization and the Jocelyn Art Museum to be one of the lending organizations. And they happen to be the one with which we are partnered for this first year. And so we have Thomas who's going to speak to some questions about this partnership and what it means for the Jocelyn and the installation that we have on the upstairs. And then we have the master who's going to be speaking to how things came together from the Figgy Zone, what it means to us here to have these works on display, and a little bit about how they, they talk to each other. I, I don't want to give everything away, so I think I'll leave it at that, and I'll let the two of you talk about the displays and how they are on view upstairs on the street. So with that, again, I want to say thank you, grab some more food, and also please join me in welcoming Thomas and Vanessa to our program. <laughs> And so uh, part of this program is also going to be recorded. I'm going to be doing kind of double duty here. I have some questions that I'm going to throw to Vanessa and Thomas. I'm going to try to take my microphone because I use my hands all the time. Um, and then I'm going to be recording here. So thank you in advance for your patience as we kind of try this new format. We're very excited to be able to host it in person live and then have the recording exist in the, uh, the internet world. So Vanessa and Thomas, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you here this evening. Um, the first question that we have for you is actually, it's just a very basic one about the Collection Loan Partnership Program. 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about your involvement with the program in terms of the museum's involvement and why this is something that you were interested in and excited about. Maybe talk a bit about what you think the value is of being part of this groundbreaking relationship and experiment. Let's start with Vanessa first and then we'll move to Tom. All right, that sounds good. Uh, so really, you kind of touched on it. it. It allows us to exhibit artwork and share art with our community that we would normally not be able to bring to our community. Um, I have to say that we're all really appreciative that the Jocelyn was willing to <laughs> lend these works to us. I mean, when you're talking about America Sad, Alexander Calder, Kende Wiley, all of these things are works that are really um, impactful. And we're really lucky to have them here at the Figgy. Um, so I can say that's why we were we were very excited about it. But also the structure of it is really innovative. So typically lending is something that you know it's it's a couple pieces. It's a behind the scenes kind of thing. Um, you maybe borrow something for an exhibition, um, and this really opens it up so that it can be. Um, more of a longer term partnership. And we were really excited to match with the Jocelyn because we hope that this partnership will continue you know, beyond um, the Sloan period and will continue to evolve and to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm echoing everything you just said about the program. Um, first of all, before I, I delve into that, I just wanted to say thank you to the Figgy for having me here tonight and thank you for for being here, uh, such a good crowd, uh, good turnout tonight. Um, since Ever since I've seen the pairings between our works and your works in the galleries this morning, I've been, you know, thinking, it's been stimulating, it's in, impressed me a lot. Um, I think it's a great way for us first to see our collections in a new light um, and get a fresh take, fresh look at works that we might be used to seeing in a certain environment. But here with this architecture, with your collections, they take a very different meaning. They are perceived in a very different way. Um, and our, I should say though that our participation in Art Bridges was, came at the perfect time for us because some of you might know that the Jocelyn just closed. Uh, we closed to the public on May 1st, 2022 to embark on a very, important uh, construction and renovation project that will last for two years. So we're scheduled to reopen in the summer of 2024. Um, so it made a lot of sense for us when we were approached to be part of this pilot program that we would send some of our works on the road and that they could remain visible and on display for people to enjoy um, instead of just sitting in storage for basically two years. Um, and so what, what you see in the galleries here at the Figgy and with the three other partners that we have, um, borrowing institutions, is really a selection of the masterpieces of Jocelyn. Um, and we're so thrilled to share those with other communities. And we're also hoping they will lead to longer term collaborations, um, definitely. And I would just add that it was also really good timing for us because the Stanley Museum of Art collection was in the process of, of moving out. And so we were moving, they moved those works out. And then a couple weeks later, we were reinstalling uh, with the Jocelyn mm -hmm. pairings. So that's great. So let's, uh, let's actually stick with Thomas for the next question. Thomas, can you, you mentioned that these were your masterworks and we all are so grateful to be borrowing them, the PB as well as the other borrowing organizations. Um, how did you pick which ones were coming out? Sure. Those in the audience will see it's a bit, it's a, an eclectic smattering of mm -hmm. books and pairings. But can you tell us a little bit about that process? On yeah, absolutely. Um, we were tasked with selecting 50 of our American works um, that would be then split into a given number of institutions. And the way we really put together this list was to allow for as much diversity as possible. Um, diversity of time period, so we have both historical American art and contemporary art. Um, diversity of media, we didn't want these 50 objects to be always on canvas. Uh, so we have sculpture as well. Um, and different medium in terms of visual arts and of painting, and also diversity of artists. 
Um, so we're giving voices to African-American artists, for example, and in indigenous artists as well. Um, and that was, that was really the way we were thinking about um, this broad list, at the same time reflecting the strength of our collections at Jocelyn. We're very strong in arts of the American West, regionalism, and also contemporary art, but at the same time offering an array of different types of works and different types of artists. Um, the way the, the list was divided after that full disclosure was, was not our work, uh, it was Art Bridges. Um, Art Bridges decided to break down this list of 50 works into groups of roughly 12 to 13 works that it would then be attributed to um, receiving museums, the borrowing museums. And um, as a result, the selections can be pretty eclectic and pretty different. Some museums will have more historical works, some museums will have more contemporary works, but um, it's also part of the, of the challenge and of the the game in a way, in the way art bridges the loan partnership functions. So of those works and then the groupings that art bridges helped put together, um, there were also some groupings that came from the LA County Museum of Art and Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Vanessa, this next question is for you. What about the Jocelyn objects in this particular grouping appeal to you and the curatorial department as well as other departments of the Figgy in terms of potential loans? Um, so I think in essence, it was because of the variety and the high quality of the works. Uh, there were some works that were on the list, like the Mary Cassatt, like the Alexander Calder, um, that we felt would be really important ones for us to share with our community. But the variety was also wonderful because there are connections to our own collection. So there are some works that very well complement our collection, like the Thomas Hart Benton could easily be in our collection. I know we can't keep it, but, <laughs> and we have a lovely one in the collection. Um, but then there are other works that are really introducing new things, like the Brad Callhammer. So, um, and of course, the Kendi Wiley is something that we're extremely lucky to have, and that was, you know, kind of a late addition to the mix. Um, but we were very lucky to get that one as well. So we thought the works would be, you know, very engaging for our community and we could see the connections that we could make even preliminarily with our own collection. And we got feedback from docents, from other staff and the education team um, to really evaluate not just the curatorial possibilities, but the possibilities you know, for education yeah. and for visitors and things that we think would uh, connect really well with the people who come into the museum and the people we want to visit the museum. So while we're on the topic of those individual works, um, let's talk a little bit about the Jocelyn and the reconstruction being closed right now, Thomas. Are there any specific works that you were especially excited to see hit the road versus hit storage for two years? There's a number of works like that. Um, I'm happy to see all the works you have here at the Figgy. Um, I'm happy to see them on walls rather than in storage. Um, but I should say that there's one particular work I'm thinking about um, very often. That's a work we, we lent to the St. Petersburg Museum of Art in Florida, which is one of the other receiving museums. And that work is an 1832 portrait of a man named Big Elk or Onkatonga. Um, who was a leader of the Omaha tribe. And that portrait by Henry Inman has a place not only in our collection, but also in the community around Omaha and around the Joslin. We've been collaborating with the Omaha people for a long time. And that painting in particular was um, the subject of a project a few years ago in which we partnered with a woman named Glenna Slater, who is fluent in the Omaha language, one of the very few people still fluent in the language, and inspired by this portrait, she translated a speech by Big Elk from English back into the Omaha language. And we offered that in the galleries in the form of a label in Omaha language and also a QR code in which you could listen to Glenna Slater deliver the speech in the original Omaha language that Big Elk would have delivered it in. The fact that this work is now in Florida is a little mind boggling. And it is very significant because it means that we're not taking just part of our collection, but part of our community and who we are to another region of the US where people might not have been exposed to these kinds of cultural artifacts 
um, imagining, you know, Omaha language being presented or listened to in Florida is pretty exciting. Um, and that's that's really the interest of this program in general, um, because I should mention that the other, part, the other partners we have, apart from the Figgy and the St. Petersburg, are the Portland Museum of Art in Maine and the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York. So great geographical diversity there. And each of the borrowing museums, it was really left up to them in terms of how they wanted to incorporate the pieces. Yeah. So some are doing full-on exhibitions, yep. just the works, and others have taken a different approach. Vanessa, um, how did you and the rest of your curatorial team develop the concepts for the grouping that we have upstairs? Can you speak about that a bit? Uh, so when we were thinking about the groupings and how we would integrate, uh, we knew that we wanted to integrate them into our permanent collections. And for us, the thing that made sense and would be most accessible to people would, would be of thematic groupings. It's also something that we're experimenting with as we think about the 100th anniversary reinstallation of our permanent collection galleries to kind of get away from these strict separations of time period and, and um, geographic location and kind of open it up more so that people can make connections um, when they're looking at works that aren't as you know mired and in having to know things like um, art historical content. And like, so we wanted these connections to be accessible to people when they're just going in and looking at the works and to make those, but also to have deeper levels to what's going on in, in dialogue between the works. So we would pair things like uh, Western landscape. Uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about later is a Thomas Moran uh, paired with uh, Will Wilson, who's an indigenous photographer. And so from the outset, it's like, oh, these are both Western landscapes. You can engage with it that way. But then you go a little bit deeper and you can uh, learn about how, um, you know, the concepts that both artists were working with are at odds with one another, how, what commonalities they share. Um, and so there's there's deeper levels to it. And so that's what we were thinking about. And we immediately, when we were looking at the works, the themes that we came up with were, of course, informed by the works from the Jocelyn, but also our knowledge of our own collection and works that we really wanted to get out and to get on view. And we were thinking about those same kind of things that you were talking about, which is having a diversity of artists on view. Um, we've been working very hard with our acquisitions to develop a more inclusive and representative uh, collection as we move forward. So that was also important to us as well. All right, so we talked about how excited we are and how wonderful everything is. I know we're gonna dig a little deeper in a minute into some of these pairings from the group. But first day, I have to ask, what challenges existed with this? I mean, this is the first time that we've entered into a project like this, I think, on both ends here. So let's start with you, Thomas, and we'll go to Vanessa. What are the challenges around doing something like this? I would say, logistically speaking, very few, <laughs> because Art Bridges has been there, and uh, the great advantage of the program is that they're taking care of the packing, the shipping, the fact that the word are, the works are delivered to the receiving institutions. Um, so, in terms of logistics, I think you you guys probably had more challenge than we had. Um, the the challenge we have because it's it's a very new program, and it's it's we're kind of the pilot program. Um, and we're letting so many great works of our collections go at the same time, is to um, assess how much involvement the borrowing institutions want from us. Meaning we provided, of course, educational material to the receiving institutions, including the Figgy. Um, but one of the, one of the specific features of the Art Bridges loan partnership is that the receiving institutions are basically free to do whatever they want basically with the work, um, which is they're free to, as you said, have a temporary exhibition or more permanent, and they're also free to involve us more or less in the process. Um, so for us, it's been a learning curve in um, partnering with institutions that we might not have had strong links with before, but that's also what why this program is exists and deciding how much we wanted to kind of oversee and be in touch with these institutions to follow the life of our works here for a year or more, so. 
And um, for me, I would say the time, the timeline was pretty rapid. Um, so was. that was something that we had to, to deal with and adjust. We're all really excited and we all saw these possibilities about how to put these into the permanent collection galleries. But you know that changing over galleries, right. I mean, it, it's a process that takes time and planning, um, especially considering that we had to repaint some of the galleries upstairs. Um, either uh, by choice or just to freshen up the space after the uh, Stanley works left. Um, so the timeline was pretty rapid. And then the other thing I would say is that, you know, there's always challenging logistics um, with certain works. So like the Kennedy Wiley is a very large work. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, I think sometimes the more difficult the work, the more rewarding it is when we get it up on the wall because it's there's there's a reason why it's hard to um, install, but it just takes patience and it takes time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the Calder is also. Um, on the other hand, it's it's very delicate, very lightweight, um, but it has its own issues, which is that you're building a mobile as it's hanging. Um, so there's a balancing and a, a holding that has to take place. So I think just some of the installation, um, but nothing, nothing too challenging on that end. Um, I would say, yeah, the, the timeline was good, but I like the fact that, you know, it happened. So it, there was a real push and a motivation to get it done. Um, so it was something that, you know, it wasn't years and years of planning, um, but it happened it happened quickly. It was executed quickly. Yeah. And Art Bridges, Art Bridges is making very everything very smooth, I would say, in the yes. process. I mean, their goal is to get art on the road, get art moving around and seen by as many people as as they can. So um, it's they make things easy, mm -hmm. whether you're on the landing or receiving it. Yes. No, I think those are all really those, those are all accurate. In terms of you know just uh, adapting and being flexible, I see that we have a couple installation shots with um, we had the Riley up just there that you mentioned. Do we want to go through any installation shots before we kind of do a deeper dive on the groupings, or do we go? I think we can just go right into the groupings. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Um, Let's go ahead and dive in. And one of the groupings with imagery familiar to us here in the Midwest, of course, is in the American Scene Gallery. Um, you know, so as we were thinking about that, what came to mind for you when you first saw the Benton flanked by the Wagner and the Abercrombie? This question is for Thomas to start us right. off. I thought what a great pairing um, because it, it really emphasizes one of the um, most striking and weirdest aspects of the Benton, which is it is a very foreboding, very dark scene, regionalist scene. Um, you know, I can think of a few other examples, but, but basically Benton spent the bulk of his career celebrating life in the Midwest, the hardworking values of Midwestern people, the, the beautiful farmland. And here you see a scene of danger, a scene of defeat in the face of nature. Um, not only does it have resonance, and we might talk about that with current issues of climate change and the way these violent phenomena like hailstorms are challenging the Midwest and agriculture here, but um, the mood of this painting is so different from many other things that he did. And uh, pairing it with the Abercrombie was um, such a great find, I think, because you have two aspects of that danger, both the natural one and the human one, reinserted onto the landscape. Um, and it was not, that's a little anecdote, but um, it, was, it was not, Benton didn't feel easy with that darkness aspect either. Um, because we have a, we know of a sketch for this painting and we have correspondence by Benton and originally there was only one human figure and the horse. There was only the, the man in the foreground running away and the horse, the mule, uh, left alone in the field. And Benton produced that sketch and then he wrote down in a note that he thought it didn't work because no good decent Midwestern farmer would ever abandon their animal in the field. Um, in such a storm. So he added a second figure behind the mule, a second farmer, 
Um, so once again, a dark scene, but he was very careful not to betray his ideal for the sort of honest, hardworking character of the figures he was depicting. Um, so one of the aspects, in addition to them being, you know, images of storms, I think there's also a real surreal quality to yes. these works. Um, if you look at, I think most, um, you know, in your face with the Gertrude Abercrombie, which uh, she was based in Chicago and a lot of her works, uh, she includes self portraits. I like to imagine that she's the one running away from the scene of the murder. <laughs> um, and so we have, you know, both of these images of people running from, yeah. from danger. Yeah. One of them from, you know, natural forces, the other from what they may have just done. Yeah. Um, in Abercrombie's work, I also really enjoy um, her inclusion of animals. There's a lot of animals, like quirky little animals. So we have an owl as kind of a witness. Um, and so if you just look at these images, um, basically they're, they're two figures and an animal interacting within a landscape. Um, they all share this similar kind of greenish, um, unnatural color palette to them, which I think kind of reminds me, you know, of an uh, incoming storm, you know, how we're always like, oh, the sky looks a little weird. There's something strange going on with the sky. Um, and the Wagner, I also like how that the, the tornado is drifting over into this pristine landscape. So you kind of get both sides. You get the, the storm and then you get the calm. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think um, connect them, but this there's also that, you know, there's something un, unsettling about all of the scenes in addition to the fact that they're storms, it's the, the way they're composed, the twisting um, figures, the twisting craggy trees, I think also are kind of spooky yeah. in both the Benton and the Abercrombie. So I think it all contributes to that mood. Yeah, I agree. There's an uncanniness to both of them. And just thinking about, um, you know, artists are never working in isolation. They're always kind of reacting to the world around them. Uh, Benton is painting in 1940, Abercrombie in 45. These are troubled times, of course, Second World War, and it affects everyone in the country, including in the Midwest. So it might be also a way for them to resort to this sort of eerie, nightmarish imagery to cope with very trying times, including for farmers. Um, you had an economic crisis followed by a global war. I mean, this, this would be enough to make you despair in a way. And in the same gallery, we have some other um, paintings that kind of get at that same unsettled and um, disturbing environment that's happening at that time. Uh, we have a work called uh, The List by George Schreiber, which is people reading the list of people killed um, uh, posted to a tree. And then we also have an image by Helen Henriksen of a uh, farmer's holiday, which was a, a conflict that happened um, in Sioux City over a uh, labor. And a, and a curry, and a John Stewart yes. curry of the mm -hmm. showing soldiers as well. Yes. So the next grouping is in the Upper West Gallery. We're going to start with Vanessa on this one. Vanessa, how do you feel this grouping relates to female power? Uh, so me, this for me, this grouping relates really strongly to female empowerment because you kind of see, um, just looking at surface level, you have the Miller painting, which is called The Trapper's Bride. Um, and it's a young indigenous woman who's being married to a fur trapper. Um, and then she's kind of surrounded by all these men who seem to be really invested in what's happening. Some of them even are like, kind of like encouraged, seem to be like encouraging her, pushing her. Um, she kind of, for me, and this could just be me reading it, I feel like she's very hesitantly putting her hand out and her face, her expression is kind of hard, hard to get a read on. So what we do know is that, you know, this was painted in 1850 and um, this was something that happened. Um, they, uh, it was basically, um, you know, Miller, I think in some of the materials we got, um, apparently witnessed a marriage like this one. And there was $1,600 in like guns and blankets that was paid to the tribe for this marriage exchange. 
And then on the other end of that, we have two modern indigenous women, Wendy Redstar and her daughter Beatrice. And they are in complete control of how they are being portrayed and what's going on in this image. They're not surrounded by men who are pushing them into situations. They are surrounded by um, items of their ancestral heritage, um, items that have ancestral power to them, things that were made by native women, elk tooth dresses, weavings, beading, and they are staring directly and confidently ahead, straight at you. So whereas the Miller is painted by somebody who's looking at the situation from you know, an outside perspective, we have Red Star who has completely created this scene and is in complete control of that portrayal. And she is also meeting the gaze of whoever is, is looking at this image. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say this is probably my favorite pairing <laughs> that you did. This is so powerful. And even more so that, to be honest, The Trapper's Bride is one of the most complicated paintings in our collections. It's the painting about which we get the most mixed reactions. Um, it's, it's an imagery that is definitely deep into a colonial patriarchal society. Um, one thing I, I should mention is that this is not um, a unique work of art. Um, Miller was working on commission for mostly East Coast patrons who wanted to have scenes of Western, you know, marriages, Western wars, Western horse ridings at their place. And so he produced seven versions of this scene. Um, they have, they're slightly different, they have slight variations, but the scene is the same. It's this Indian bride, so-called scene. Um, so he is really tapping into the heritage of European art as well, um, because he doesn't want his view of the West to be documentary. He doesn't want necessarily to document it as it happened, but as it would please the sensibility of his patrons back in the East. And each time I look at this at this bride, at this um, Native American woman, I just think about her posture as a sort of contrapposto, which is this uh, very classical posture that we um, that exists since antiquity uh, in Greek and, and Latin sculpture, which is this sort of slightly bent knee that gives you a more dynamic figure instead of just a you know static stoic person. And she is depicted like a goddess could be depicted, like Venus. So she is depicted as an ideal female figure that is basically laid out here for men to enjoy and to consume. And the great difference with Wendy Redstar and her daughter is that they are adopting the posture that's most comfortable to them and that makes them look confident. They're not stuck in this sort of corset of the classical, almost Greek-like posture of contrabosto that he is using. Um, so it's it's great because it's it frees her body in a way, mm -hmm. being displayed next to this contemporary work. Thomas, we're going to stay with you sure. to kick us off with this next question and answer. Um, so for the next parent, environmental issues, <sighs> whether pollution, land conservation, or climate change, are of great concern today. But these issues have a long history in the United States. How does this parent address changes to the American landscape, and yeah. how do those changes Sorry, how those changes were portrayed or not portrayed in art? Well, that's another great pairing on your part, I would say. Um, the fact that the Wilson is representing a mine, so is representing direct damage to the environment, is actually a great way to get into what this Moran painting is really about. So when you when you look at this painting, um, you know, you might see a representation of a pristine, untouched nature this sort of west of imagination this is the grand canyon except um what i like to tell to um you know people who ask me about this painting is that this is a deception this is an illusion and the reason for it is that the date of this painting is is i mean it's pretty late it's 1913 and at the time the grand canyon doesn't look like this anymore i mean it looks like this but the environment around the canyon has been profoundly transformed by tourism and the tourism industry um, 
One year before Moran goes to the canyon to paint this is the inauguration of the first asphalt road on the south rim of the canyon. So when he is there painting this seemingly untouched landscape, there are already cars driving around everywhere. And there are, of course, hotels and facilities to accommodate all these tourists. And you might say, well, Moran is probably protesting that a lot. Um, and he is, he is probably appalled by the damage to the environment, which is in part true. Um, but his trip to paint this one was also funded by the owners of a luxury hotel on the south rim of the Grand Canyon called the El Tovar Hotel, and it still exists today. So he is there paid for by the people who change the environment for the needs of tourism, for infrastructure and transportation. And just having a picture like the Wilson next to it, that's a more obvious depiction and criticism of damage to the environment. I feel it's, it's like um, pointing a direct light at Moran and saying, and what about you? you know, what are you really showing us? And what did you actually encounter when you were there? Yeah, he's really, Wilson is really putting that center stage yeah. And I think something that's also really interesting about the Wilson is that you can barely see it, but Monument Valley is in the far distant horizon of that photograph, which has been in countless Hollywood movies. Um, so many people have photographed Monument Valley. It's so famous. But we're not looking at, you know, only the splendor of the landscape as Moran portrays. We are looking at the reality of what's been done to the Western environment. And a lot of times to, um, you know, this is actually on Navajo land that this, um, it's a disposal site for material from uh, uranium mining. And so it's like tons and tons of, of debris from this mining operation. Um, and it's not something that you would know if you were going to drive into yeah. Monument Valley that this is just not too far away. Um, but Wilson really puts that center stage and um, comparing it to the Moran, I think has a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on. Yeah. There's a lot going on there. And Wilson, I mean, he doesn't stop here and his other, um, this is part of his practice is also he um, represents himself as a man living in like a post-apocalyptic world. So this is present day. This is the reality of present day. But then he also portrays himself as this indigenous man in the future, trying to deal with um, and even terraform the environment back to what it once was. Um, he also portrays himself in the Grand Canyon, which is a sacred site mm -hmm. for many indigenous people. It's supposed to be a place of, of their creation in their in stories and creation stories. And so that's also part of this conversation is the Grand Canyon is a sacred site. Monument Valley is a yeah. sacred site. And, um, you know, look at what has been done to, yeah. to their land. I agree. And I, I could just add very quickly that um, when I see pairings like this, I'm reminded why Art Bridges exist and what this program exists, because this Moran picture is um, one of the most beloved works in our collection. And it's one of the oldest too. Um, it was in, in the collection of a Mrs. Dietz from Omaha who gave the sort of foundational collection to the museum in um, 1934 for the collection really to kick off, to start off. So it's been with us forever, <laughs> for as long as Jocelyn has existed. And it's good to be able to look at it in a more critical eye nowadays. It is a gorgeous painting. <laughs> it is gorgeous, though. <laughs> it is an absolutely stunning painting. Um, and, you know, that I think makes the comparison all the more mm -hmm. strong. Yeah. All right, uh, next talking site, we're going to move to the Northern European Gallery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, with this one, of course, we have, we've seen Andy Wiley in here. So typically, we're walking through historical galleries and museums. What we'll see are portraits of people who all look the same. Vanessa, we're going to start with you and comment on this. What motivated the placement of the Wiley in this? I guess we'll start with you on the motivation for the placement, and we'll go to Thomas for comments. Great. Um, so basically, uh, with the Wiley, we um, it's a big, gorgeous painting. And we knew that we wanted there to be a conversation between the Wiley and that the more traditional 
uh, European portraiture. And our strongest large portraits uh, that we felt would make the strongest comparison are in our Northern European gallery. Um, the fact is that many of those portraits are of women. Um, and we really love, or I, I really love in particular, the way their expressions relate to one another, um, but also just the simple fact of who is being represented and why, and, and you know, what the, what the past is versus um, contemporary and what Wiley is trying to do in his work by kind of um, showing that the people that he's portraying are just as worthy uh, of being portrayed in this grand manner. And I think it's had um, that conversation uh, was strongest in that gallery. Yeah, I agree. And also considering that Wiley has um, a sort of classic art history education, meaning he started off by studying the old masters and the so-called art history canon. And what he does is really subvert it. Um, so by, by pairing the Wiley as you did with all these aristocratic portraits of, of white women, it gives an importance and, and finally a place in history to those three black women that he's depicting there. And these are not um, the sitters, the Wiley sitters, they're not people of power. Um, what he does is he's not hiring professional models. He is literally meeting people on the street and asking them to post for him. And so these three women, they're from Ferguson, Missouri, um, which at the time, Wiley, when he painted that, was in residence in St. Louis. At the time, Ferguson was still, and I think it still is, vivid in people's minds for the murder of an African-American man um, at the hands of the police and, you know, unrest that ensued. And so he's also reacting to that because he is inviting three women from that community to pose. Um, the, the great thing about the way the Wiley is placed here at the Figgy is this narrow opening that leads to it and that when you finally reach the threshold makes the painting explode mm -hmm. into your, basically into your face. Um, it's like you have this narrow focused view of the painting and suddenly you pass this narrow threshold and the painting expands. And it's... The size is really impressive. The size, I believe, I you know, was um, an issue for transportation and things like this, but it's it's worth it um, because it's the effect it has in this gallery is just incredible, and the size really takes meaning there. Absolutely, I mean, it's so it it does it really inhabits the space in a really yes. powerful way. Um, another thing that I would say is that it's like a magnet to yeah. our visitors and particularly uh, children, um, visitors who don't normally get to see themselves represented yes. and reflected yeah. in the paintings that are on, on display in a lot of museums. Yeah. And particularly, I mean, in that gallery, it was traditionally, it was our Northern Europe, it is our Northern European gallery. And so um, the works in that were not works, I mean, they're 400 years ago, wealthy um, uh, white women from, you know, the Netherlands. <laughs> and, yeah. um, so it, it's not, it's very separated from people's realities. Um, whereas this is very connecting, very accessible. Yeah. It's something that they can see themselves in. And yeah. I think people get they connect and it's very exciting and it's very meaningful to have that. Yeah, absolutely. And it reminds me of, of actually a lot of public reactions that were expressed when the Wiley portrait of Barack Obama came to the National Portrait Gallery in DC along with the Amy Sherrill portrait of Michelle Obama. And most visitors who stood in front of those said, um, well, for many of them, they said, I can finally see someone like me represented there or someone looking more like me. Um, it's, it's a tough job for museums. Um, I think these kinds of pairings that can help us move forward as museums, as institutions, to show more diverse uh, people on the walls. I will just um, conclude by saying that it, it reminds me of uh, another strategy that I saw in place at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston recently. I was there. Um, in their colonial galleries, um, among portraits such as these ones of colonial aristocrats, they put an empty frame. 
that lets you see the wall behind it directly. And the label says, here is a frame representing all the people who could not be portrayed at the time because it didn't have the money or the social situation or the connections to be portrayed by famous painters. Um, so again, different strategies, but I think this is, this is a meaningful pairing and a meaningful sort of visual collusion to have in this gallery. The importance of representation in art also leads us into the next grouping, and this will be the final grouping that we explore this evening, although there's much more to explore upstairs, of course. So uh, Thomas, we're going to start with you on sure. this. How does Ritter's work reflect the mythicized images of Native American communities? And how does that conversation change by presenting it alongside works like Kara and Diego? Sure. Um, that Ritter is actually one of my favorite artworks at, at Jocelyn. Um, and not just because the painter and I share a surname. Um, we're not related. We're both called Ritter, but not related. Um, this is such a fascinating picture because it really shows how the idea of the West was constructed through images, through visual culture, and on an international scale before the Civil War. Ritter is a German painter. He was born in Canada. Um, his father was British and mother uh, German, but he never visited the Plains. He, when he was a child, he moved back to Germany, to Stuttgart, um, and he spent the rest of his life in Germany. So when he paints that in 1850, he paints that not out of uh, any observation or any reality of the West. He paints that because he reads novels in German that are set in a romanticized West. There's a vogue in Germany at the time for this literature of great adventures in the outdoors of Texas, of the Great Plains. And this is also fueling the imagination of many German immigrants who will then settle these plains. Um, and so what he is showing in, in his painting is a myth of the Native American. Um, it's even a myth that historically has had this it's the name for it. So the myth of the vanishing Indian um, that was devised at the time, meaning Native Americans were to be respected. They were considered noble. They were considered, um, you know, fierce warriors, but eventually they were doomed to disappear to make way for the white settler. And he's definitely tapping into that. This is a group of people huddled on the rock, completely frightened, under attack. So, um, conventional in their poses. I mean, it reminds me of a lot of, um, of works, um, of European artworks, you know, the Raft of the Medusa, this sort of triangle um, shape. And the costumes and the props that he depicts, they're all just, they're wrong, basically. They're all just wrong. So he's interested in the drama of it, and he's interested in staging it. And seeing um, it with the Romero, the Carol Romero, uh, that I'm sure you, you, know, you have a lot of things to say about, is just, to me, it shows a continuation through visual culture of that sort of mythicization of the American Indian. Before that, it was painting, and then it became photography, and then it became cinema, and then it became TV, et cetera. Yeah, so absolutely. So if you look at the Carol Romero photograph, which is called TV Indians, you can see that on all these piled up TVs are images from like Hollywood movies of Native Americans. You can see Iron Eyes Cody, which who um, he was in the Keep America Beautiful campaign, but it turns out he was Italian American, so he was not even uh, you know a Native American. Um, and you can see you know still from Dances with Wolves. So all of these Hollywood portrayals of what indigenous people. Um, how they're portraying indigenous people. But what Kara has done is she uh, collaborates directly with friends, with family, with people from her tribe and other time, tribes to create these images of modern indigeneity that challenge um, other, other portrayals of indigeneity through time. And so she has um, people standing who are modern indigenous people in front of those televisions. And they are taking ownership of their own representation. And like the Wendy Red Star, they have a hand in how they are being portrayed. Um, it is a collaboration. It's not just Cara Romero telling them, you know, 
how this is going to be, it, there's a back and forth going on with the production of these photographs. And then you have, um, you know, Kara's husband, Diego, is a Coquiti Pueblo potter. And with him, we have this wonderful pot that is um, showing a, a leader of the Pueblo revolt who revolted against, um, you know, people trying to control and dominate the indigenous population. And he um, revolted against that, um, trying to be dominated by Spanish um, missionaries. And he really towers over them. And then another thing I would mention is that just purely um, the composition, all three of these have like a pyramidal yeah. construction. Um, they're all theatrical yes. and a very dramatic um, in their own way, but they have, you know, they have different things that they're trying to do with those compositions. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just the fact that these three are together in the galleries, I like to think of it of a, as a way to, um, so the, the native people portrayed by Ritter never had the chance to respond mm -hmm. or to counteract the image of themselves that was spread everywhere. And through these contemporary works, we can offer a way for, I mean, it was, it's of course indirect and delayed, but a way for the sitters to respond mm -hmm. and to help sort of neutralize the, the racist message in some of these works, even if through time, you know, across time, so. I want to thank you both for sharing with us this evening, and also I want to thank your, your teams for making this possible. It was a lot of work very quickly, but it's such a reward. I mean, there are treasures upstairs and new ways of looking, and I think we're going to stay with us and then keep us curious and coming back again and again. As a reminder, we're, uh, we are going to have on this day until September 2023. So you do have time tonight, but also for the next year, and we're grateful for that. Are you okay taking any questions sure. from the audience? Yeah. I'm going to. Yeah. I have another audience, so do you have a question? For all of this, I'm going to come to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yes, when the jobs are reopened, what will you expect from the fee? Is it there or is there? We're hoping for a long-term partnership. <laughs> so we would love to keep in touch with the Figgy and see how we can promote their collections as well. Um, oh, uh, follow up question. Sure. I'm thinking about the look of the nation collection that we have here, which is a pretty unique collection. Mm -hmm. That might be one that would go well in Great, thank you. I, I, I pitch for that. Sure. <laughs> I do have a question that I just wanted to express my thanks for the love possibilities and that it was, it's just been so energizing for the collection. And, um, you know, I walked into that 18th century gallery and I just tears just fell out of my eyes when I saw the pink yeah. white. And it was, it was really, really yeah. So um, all, of the, all of the parents, I think, have just been exquisite. And that's credit to your staff, to our staff, as well as one of the wonderful words that we have. So. Are there any other questions or comments during this? Okay. Uh, when you selected the works, uh, did you have any idea? Had you been here to see the space when they lived in this place? You had no, no idea. No, and that was that's kind of that's part of the thrill of it. <laughs> This, this was my first visit to the Figgy today. Um, yes, yeah, and um, I've not been disappointed because their, their team and the staff here have done a fantastic job. And again, the, that's the, the program's identity is about that. It's about letting the borrowing institutions cast some new light on the works, however they want to do that. Um, and here, I think it's, it works really well. They all work really well. Interesting. I used to be in Omaha to the University of Omaha. Okay. Um, members of the Broadway Omaha. So I've been to Jocelyn and Earth Bridges. Tell a little bit more about that. Uh, are they doing a program that's more like um, exhibit? Traveling exhibit organization now? 
They're doing, so they're an offshoot of Crystal Bridges. So they've been relying a lot on the collections that are Crystal Bridges to support some initiatives and they've really been diversifying. So there's this loan partnership, but now um, Art Bridges also has their, their own collection of artworks that museums can borrow for either for um, exhibitions or for display in their galleries. And they also have uh, packet shows. So um, you, you could just ask for a show to come. And to we museum. actually just had one of the shows available, um, Border Cantos, Sonic Borders, mm. through Art Bridges. Um, so they're highly, um, I think what's great about Art Bridges is that they not only create these opportunities, but they really support yeah. um, both financially and strategically the institutions who um, want to participate. Um, so they help with, you know, all the logistics. They make it, they, they make it so much easier yeah. um, for the institutions because there are so many barriers that normally exist, whether it's, um, you know, cost or logistics yeah. or things like that. Um, and they really take those away so that it's a lot easier to, to um, take part. I am familiar with that a little bit. I used to be in California with Pacific Cosmic which is a smaller exhibit organization that works. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, they did everything that they did for you. But I think they're kind of modeled over the Smithsonian and yeah. the Indian Army history process. Yeah. Thank you for a little bit of testing the programming perspective with this relationship with our project support for the students and also the CLD and Pokemon partnership. Um, they truly are the partners. Every regard, and when they when they when we ask for a request funding for programming to go alongside what is on the display, they encourage us to think about projects we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And that's why you saw a lot of really cool new ideas for border contacts. And stay tuned because we have more really cool ideas right. coming for the CLP. We're just putting it out on the request next week. Um, they were missing the entire application process and truly our partners. I think that that would really conclude the formal part of the presentation, but there is still some food available in the back, so please help yourselves. Such a pleasure having you here this evening. Um, thanks for staying cool inside with our air conditioning and also for our very cool program. Thomas and Vanessa, I want to thank you so much. This was thank you. a great conversation. Uh, please join me in making this Days are free every week from 5 to 8 p.m. Of course, you are in our free summer, our July, to July right now, so the timing doesn't matter. But every Thursday, we're free from 5 to 8. And we do have a program that's going to see you next week. We're going to start the talk. We'll have a cash bar before we have a few topics. We're going to talk about this And we'll be focusing on the Brack exhibition, which is lovely. And we'll talk about the Brack exhibition. And we'll be focusing on the Brack exhibition, which is lovely. And so there's a lot of exciting happening. So thank you all. We'll see you next time. And yeah, thank you.